Hi guys, welcome to our podcast on social media too. I'm Brooke and I'm here with Michael and Chris. And Hello. Uh, the Hi. first question I want to ask you guys, um, just based off of the topic of social media, do you guys generally think social media is good or bad? Let's start with you, uh, Michael. So I would say that it's kind of a win-lose situation with social media. I feel that social media has is groundbreaking in trying to stay in contact with friends and family and things like that, but I think it's become much too like the focus on our lives, and I don't think that it's something that we need to focus on as much as people are focusing on it today. Like I remember hearing something actually it was like a few weeks ago where somebody said everybody's at these events, but no one's actually there. Because everybody's focused on getting it on social media, like Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram. It's like, if you don't Snapchat it or Instagram it, you weren't actually there. And I even said the same thing to my cousin who was in Disney last week. I'm like, I'm surprised he's constantly looking to go back. And I said, now I know why you want to go, constantly go back, because you're always in your phone and you miss everything that's going on in front of you. So I think it's kind of like a win-lose situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that's kind of a big thing, especially to mention, is that idea that we're always constantly thinking about it. So even if we're sort of trying to be in the moment and trying to enjoy an event or something, you're thinking, oh, well, I need to put this on Instagram or this picture would look good on Snapchat and all, mm-hmm. you know, it'll get a lot of likes and stuff like that. So it's always sort of in the back of your mind, even if you're trying to um, avoid it. Um, yeah. But I think, well, my take is that I kind of think that social media is a tool, right? So you can use it for good. You can use it for bad. So I don't think that it really has a sort of good or bad. I think that generally just people um, choose to use it in specific ways, and that can be either either good or bad. So that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I feel like, especially with education, it can be a really positive tool because the teacher should be implementing if they are implementing social media or technology, it should be meaningful and it should be tied to an assessment that's actually going to benefit the students. So if it's being used in a way like that, that's appropriate and actually uh, has some uh, justification behind it, then it really is generally good. It was created for that reason. It was created for global communications and enhancement. But um, when we are coming down and talking to the psychology of social media and psychology of being human, especially target audience like adolescents who are more uh, prone uh, and susceptible to, for example, like cyberbullying and whatnot, um, it can be negative. But then again, there's also the take that bullying existed before cyberbullying, et cetera. So, yeah, I agree. It really comes down to how it's being used in what situation. Um, but yeah. to back tying back to education, um, the the article – that was by Tang and Hugh on using Twitter for education. Um, what did you guys think of that article? Do you think Twitter could be a beneficial uh, way to use it, or do you think kids would get too distracted? I think Twitter is much too distracting. Um, just I, I have a Twitter. I don't u- really use it, but I feel like there's so, you, there's so many black holes you can go down. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really... And not to mention, Twitter doesn't really have, like, filters like Facebook and Instagram do. Yeah. Like, inappropriate uh, inappropriate content's not filtered mm-hmm. in Twitter. You're able to look at things that probably you wouldn't want to look at in a classroom. So I think that um, it's a good idea in the sense that they're trying to go down a road in which they're trying to connect students' lives and education. So I agree with that. Twitter, I think, is too open though and easily available to look at other things to be used though so maybe we can use something that's like a faux twitter thing that maybe teachers can um create for educational purposes but it acts like a twitter account so i don't know but i just think that twitter is a little it's a little dangerous because i think that there's a lot of um rabbit holes to go down that students can get easily distracted but that's just me i don't know what chris thinks or you bro yeah no i i tend to agree i'm not a huge fan of twitter either i have one and our uh the principal of the high school that i'm at is actually sort of big on having us all create a twitter and he wants the teachers to kind of use it um to kind of connect with students outside the classroom but i think 
generally I'm not I'm not really a fan of the format, but I think also like you said it's a little kind of open and it's a little um too uh easily I guess abused sort of for students. So I think mm-hmm. um I th- I think it sort of hits on a good idea though, which is um how can we communicate and push things to our students in kind of new ways that they're already using? And I might just disagree with the use of Twitter specifically, but I think that the concept underlying it, I think it's a good concept at its heart. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, I would say that the when Twitter first came out, uh, it was used a lot, at least for, based on my personal experiences in my classrooms. For example, one activity we did a lot was we would read a book and then we would take – um, the characters from the book and assign them to groups and we'd make a Twitter account for that character and speak um, mm. as that character mm. to kind of get a sense of who they are, build a profile for them. And I thought that was mm. great because Twitter wasn't as big of a platform yet, so there weren't yes. too many distractors. But um, you guys are right. It is a big, it's a very open format and it's yeah. great to connect globally outside of the classroom, um, especially if you're trying to publish student work. For example, it'd be great for like college students to publish uh, creative writing if they were an English major or case studies for whichever psychology or whatever it may be. But um, there's just too many things that it can become dangerous with. But I do mm-hmm. think that um, students even having the option to communicate on a platform such as Moodle is a lot more beneficial for them to have access to the teacher and to their peers. I just don't think that it should be in place of, like as a substitute of the classroom communication. I think that should take importance first instead of completely getting rid of that communication. Yeah. I was a little, I was confused when Chris, you said that you created uh, Twitter because the principal wants you to connect with students. I find that interesting because my elementary school and high school had a rule that stu- that teachers were not allowed to be f- on any kinds of social media, be friends or following students because of certain issues and things like that. Yeah. But, so I think that that's a good idea, but I think that the school can create their own version of Twitter for that kind of example, for that kind of interaction. I th- had we been discussing this five or six years ago, I would say, yeah, definitely we can use Twitter for education. But since more recently, Twitter has become very easily available to some and just some of the things that you're able to view on Twitter is not okay. And I think that also the climate of today's political field too is also creating Twitter to be this like kind of like battleground. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we really want to instill in students. So for me, Like I was saying before, Twitter, the idea I think is cool to have students and teachers have a Twitter account to go back and forth. And I love what you had said, Brooke, about how having creating Twitter accounts for book characters. Mm -hmm. But I think that due to today's climate and the just what's on Twitter today, that kind of project would have to be either made theoretically or on a a private website that's specific to the students like our Moodle, because I think that it's too, it's too easy to get into arguments or fights or just be in an uncomfortable situation on Twitter today. Yeah. I know that um, one thing that stood out to me from the readings this week was the Greenhow and Lewin reading where it said that teachers perceive technology uh, such as using Twitter was a great way for students to interact, but the students spoke out and actually said they'd prefer to have something like Moodle over that. So that was the biggest takeaway I had, um, because at first I was like, oh, it's probably great because parents can stay connected and whatnot, but you're right, there's too many inappropriate things and whatnot that are just going to completely distract them. And also, we're trying to teach students to find more accurate sources and not yeah. listen to the things that are just posted online and especially adolescents are so susceptible to believing everything they read. Yeah. And I know teachers want to create an atmosphere where it kind of blends the everyday of students with the education, but there are some aspects where I think that it should be cut off and it should be two separate things. Social media. I think you can be able to use it in lessons, but I like examples and to show examples to explain a lesson, but I don't think it should be, a center point of a lesson. 
Yeah, well, kind of, and and we all kind of came on the same point, which is that we liked the idea of using, say, Twitter for something uh, in the classroom, but not the idea of using Twitter itself, um, mm-hmm. as in the, the website itself or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And just an example of that, I, I knew someone in a previous class where he said that he had his students, he was a history teacher, he made them make like a post about history on Instagram, but he didn't actually yeah. make them post it. He just sort of made them like write it out and like plan it. Yeah. Right. But he didn't want them to actually post it because then if you're having them post yeah. something on Instagram during class, they're just going to go on Instagram. Yeah. So, yeah. The, well, I think it would also be a good idea to use that kind of thinking with like a project mm-hmm. but, but where they can get up take a class or two and get up and do things. They can cut things out. They can draw things. They can write things. Let them use that. They don't always have to use technology because technology at the end of the day, you could still be sitting there, but you're just on a computer instead of writing something down. Whereas if you tell them create a poster that looks like an Instagram post, they're going to get really into it and they're going to be like, Oh, well we can use this, this and this. And you don't have that worry of them getting, going down rabbit holes and getting distracted on with inappropriate content. Yeah, I definitely, I see where you're coming from with that. I've seen those um, Instagram posters before, and mm-hmm. students really do get into it. I observed at uh, Mineola High School last semester, and they had to do, I don't remember if it was a final project or if it was just a, um, like a final, um, like a summit, some form of summative assessment, uh, where they got to choose what they wanted to do, and a part of one of the things the students did was an Instagram uh, poster and they had it hanging up in the classroom for the end of the year. So I have mm-hmm. seen it before and they, they do like it. It's something familiar for them and a lot of the times um, people recommend integrating like pop culture and whatnot into the lessons so that the students are more engaged. So that's a good way of doing an alternate substitution but not directly relying on the social media. Yeah. Yeah, well again, I think like you said, students kind of really get into it and they're already kind of thinking in that mode pretty much every day, but it's, you're sort of modifying it so that they're not going to get uh, sidetracked or they're not just going to sit there on Instagram the whole period. And again, like, like Michael said, you're getting them, uh, what's the difference between sitting at a desk and writing and sitting at a desk on a computer, right? But this way you're sort of getting them out of their chairs and getting them off the, mm-hmm. off the computer a little bit, you know? Yeah. Cause I mean, sitting there writing, yeah, it's bad that the kids are sitting there the entire time. But at least they are sitting there because I'm, I'm going to sound like one of the older teachers, I guess. But <laughs> studies studies do show that writing things down is more beneficial than sitting there and typing it out. And I speak from experience. I've had classes. I mean, stupidly, I took my own experiment and said, oh, what's going to work best for me? I had one class where I was sitting there typing everything out the entire time. And. I didn't do as good in that class as I did in the classes that I constantly wrote down notes and I constantly had a notebook out or I had notes in the margins of my, um, I'm the type of person I like to print out the readings that we have to do for this class because I highlight things, I I write annotations in it. It's just how I work best and that's how studies have shown that some people work best. There are some that the computer may work best, but I feel like it's easier to get lost with technology than it is with sitting there writing something yes it might be boring but at least it's it's it has better statistics of sticking with you than it would using technology yeah it's also offering multiple ways of actually exercising the memorization mm-hmm. portion of the material because you don't necessarily yeah. have to learn the material even just from writing it alone if you're writing it down and then you're Going further with it, some students might prefer to type it up. Some students might prefer to write it. But as long as the assessments surrounding it are um, available for students to choose what they want to do, then that's really all that matters in the end. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for that, too. I feel that if it's best for them, more power to them. If it doesn't work, pulling the student aside and saying, well, listen, what else can we do that might work better? Because clearly this isn't working. Right, yeah, for me, as long as they're handing in the... As long as they're handing in the assignment, I don't really care what format it's in. And there's sort yeah. of this big push now, like everything has to be digital, but some of my students don't want to, you know, yeah. don't want to hand it in on the yeah. computer. So mm-hmm. I used to like typing things up because I'm like, oh, this is so much easier. Now I find myself writing it out and I'm like, I have to type it up and I have to send it in. I'd much rather <laughs> right. hand it in. Right. So 
I mean, I think it's also like one of those mentalities of even though you wanted to do it, a teacher tells you to do it, and now you're like, oh, well, I don't really want it. Like that kind of spitefulness. Exactly. That's like not intentional spitefulness, but it's just like who we are. Right. Yeah. yeah. The um, minute you're told to do something, you stop wanting to do it. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> like I love reading. I love reading. I wanted to read The Handmaid's Tale so bad. I was told I had to read it for a class, and I didn't want to pick it Suddenly up. Suddenly, don't. Want and it. Then yep. That exactly. class ended, and I sat there and read it, and I loved it. So, it's that kind of mentality. It's just. And I don't want to be like that. I try my best not to be like that, but sometimes it just can't be helped, especially with certain kids that may have like different situations where they don't have the ability to learn like their peers and it's frustrating for them. And then they're like, you know what? I'm not even going to try. So I think that's kind of where it can go too. Yeah. And I think that kind of ties back into the whole idea of trying to use tech and social media in the classrooms is that, it can be difficult because suddenly something that a student might love to do, like, you know, use Twitter or use Instagram, the teacher says, were you doing this for a project? And they go, oh, I don't I don't want to do that now. Yeah. I don't want to make a video now, even though they do it constantly in their free time. You know, yeah. So. That's how I feel. It's, I mean, I agree that technology needs to be implicated because we are moving forward. We need to keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. But I think we need to be careful with how we do it too, especially with technology, because you don't have the same you don't have the same problems that you would have had in the past. Now you have the the problems of you need to lock this site for them, and they can only use this site. And then some mm-hmm. students are smart enough to go through that, right? And jailbreak that, but they can't figure out what you need for a pro- like. It's, <laughs> it amazes me because I, I, what I'm student observing now, some of the students, I mean, not to say they're dumb, but some of the questions they asked them, like, I, I would have known that at that their age. Meanwhile, they jailbroke their iPads and they're able to play Tetris while the teacher's sitting up there trying to explain something to them. Exactly. So it's, it's different problems that we need to face, which I, comes with any kind of new idea, I guess, but I mean, is it going to be able to be fixed or is it going to be con- constant with like these students are constantly going to be able to find a way to get around it. So I think it's a good idea to use, but with caution and with gradually in the beginning. So let me ask this before we uh, wrap up the podcast, Um, just as like a final exit question. Do you guys think that um, in your future classrooms, you are going to kind of address the question of social media with your students, um, whether it be, uh, pertaining to reliable sources or um, asking them what they would prefer if they want to use social media in the classroom? Um, because I know that one article I mentioned before, the students expressed that they did not. Would you allow that opportunity for your students in the classroom? Um, I think I would, but with guidelines to follow, I guess. I like I said, I'm all for anything that helps students learn. Yeah. So I would suggest it to them if they wanted to do that, try that out. And then seeing if it's not working, even if some kids get upset with you, you're going to have to say, okay, this isn't working for the majority. We need to find a new way to go about this. So I think that I'll keep it open, but I'm also going to keep it open in the sense that I have the right to shut it down. Mm-hmm. If I need to, and we can go back, like still use technology, but not social media. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's my kind of thing is I'm open either way. I don't really sort of fall hard on one side or the other. And, um, you know, like like Michael was saying, you know, if students think that it helps and if they're doing the assignments that uh, that you know it's involved with and if they're doing them well and it's not proving to be distracting um or if they're not and if they're enjoying it of course then you know i would be kind of opening to keeping it or uh, continuing with it or building on it but Mm -hmm. you know if it can become a distraction or if it becomes a problem for a lot of students then yeah i'm also open to kind of not not using it so i think it's i don't know i'm i'm open to it kind of either way yes or no yeah, it's just social media in this. I feel like this is the one part of technology that needs to be separate sometimes. So I'm a little hesitant in letting it go forward, but I will let it go forward to see what happens. But I think this is the part that should be separate and shouldn't be introduced into education because teachers and students aren't allowed to be friends on social media for certain schools. And that's like the right. rule. So I think that that can be 
this kind of blurs the line a little bit and it could go either way. So just my viewpoint on it. So I know, Brooke, what were you about to talk, say about it? Oh, I was going to say that um, I I would probably do the same thing as both of you guys. I would offer it if my students had sparked an interest in it, because um, I, I do want to make sure that uh, the majority is getting their uh, their needs assessed. But at the same time, I don't want just the majority of the bell curve to be um, the ones that are receiving what they need. Uh, so I would definitely make it optional. But if it got to the point where I didn't think it was a meaningful assessment, I would take it away because there are so many different um, options and platforms through technology that we could use alternatively to social media. Um, and I do agree that I think social media in itself should stay social media, like literal um, a social platform for the students to exercise when they're not in school so that they can unwind and use it at their leisure if they choose to. Um, but I'm very flexible. So I guess I would, I would always give it a shot. Yeah. Um, but do you guys it have may any- separate kids from their? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say it may separate kids from their social media accounts for a little bit too. We could end the epidemic of students <laughs> constantly being sucked in. Just have all the stu- all the teachers be like, okay, you have to post this, this, and this, and like this, this, and this for homework. <laughs> That's I don't really want to do that. Yeah. Oh, suddenly so. I don't want to use Instagram anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because now it's covered with all my friends' posts for their history and English classes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's 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 not bad. I like that. So, just well, that's thought. that's <laughs> sort of something that I was thinking about is using all this tech in schools and things like that. And then, I mean, the thing is, they're going to go home and they use their computers anyway all the time, right? So, yeah. at school, do they really need to be on the iPad or on their Chromebook and things like that? That's true. It's just it, it's kind of just one of those things that. Um, you know, what, what do we, what do we want to accomplish in school? Uh, and maybe we want to accomplish, uh, having them be tech literate or something like that, but also maybe we want to accomplish getting them away from all of that, that they have at home all the time. But yeah, yeah. that's a different story. Yeah. Right. Do you guys have, um, any more questions that you want to address? Um, none that come to my mind. I think we kind of discussed what I thought we would. How about you, Chris? No, I don't have anything particularly. I sort of got everything out that I wanted to talk about. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, and thanks, everyone, for uh, listening to our podcast. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.